Okay. You know, a couple of months ago now, Pastor Neville asked me to do a small group on forgiveness. And so seeing as I'd never done one of those before, I thought I'd better do some research and some study. And, and so I've learned a whole lot of things, which I've been sharing with you of a Sunday as well. But if we, the first thing we discovered was that, and we did this a few weeks ago, that there's three different sorts of forgiveness. There's divine forgiveness, which is given to us by God because of the work that Christ did on the cross. There's interpersonal forgiveness, which we talked about last time, where we forgive somebody else. And who can remember the Greek word for forgiveness? I was only, only a few weeks ago. <laughs> it was a Femi. Remember? To release and set free. That's one of the big things, and that is a verb, so it's a doing word. So when we offer forgiveness to somebody, it's something that we do, and we don't get anything in return for it. But, there we go. So we'll, might, we'll mention that a few times today, and by the end of the message, maybe you'll remember a Femi, to release and let go, which is the meaning of forgiveness. So today I want to talk about the, the third aspect of forgiveness, which is personal forgiveness, or forgiving yourself. Now, did you know you have to do that? That's the hardest forgiveness of all for most people. And we'll look at that as we go through. You know, when I was a teenager a year or two ago, I used to work cutting lawns and mowing, doing gardening, all sorts of stuff. But there's one builder, handyman guy in our church who always worked by himself. He was never happy. I never saw him smile. I never saw him... Never heard him tell a joke or anything like that. And, but he used to sometimes get me to come and help him. With a two, for you needed two men for a big job of a, of a school holidays. And so I used to go and, and work with him. And uh, we got talking one day and he said to me, uh, you know, I've only got God's second best for my life. I thought, how has that happened? And so he told me the story. When he was a young guy, about the age I was in, in his teens, God spoke to him about becoming a missionary in Africa. And that was his dream and that was his goal in life. So he finished his apprenticeship as a builder. He went to work for a few years. He had enough money to go to Bible college. And he was, had his heart and his mind set on going to Africa to be a missionary. Well, somewhere along the line while he was doing that, a young lady came across his path. And you know the story, he fell in love with this young lady, they fell in love with one another, they got engaged, and then we'll call this guy John, he spoke to his fiancée about his dream of going to Africa as a missionary, and she said, well there's no way not, I'm going. So he had a big decision to make, of whether he was going to remain with, with his uh, fiancée or go to Africa. He decided to stay with his fiancée and get married, and from that point on, he always was miserable and he said that he had God's second best for his life. Now, I don't read in scripture where God gives us his second best. But this guy was like that. He was a miserable person, not very happy. And he lived like that. He died early. Uh, but that was just his life. I remember one time we went to uh, his place for lunch and I'm not being disrespectful, but it was like walking into a morgue. It was just so silent and so cold and so quiet. But that's, that's John's story. But what about the 45-year-old mother who's living with regret all her life because when she was 17, she had an abortion? And there are a lot of people around like that. Or the businessman who hadn't went overseas on a business trip and had an affair. And he could never forgive himself. He comes home and throws his whole life into, the, into his job. His marriage broke up and everything else that was wrong, could, could have gone wrong, happened. So what's the common denominator in those three stories? Guilt. Every one of those people were riddled with guilt. 
And it's like carrying a backpack in which Satan fills with another brick of guilt or regret each time he reminds us of what we did or what we didn't do. And it's exhausting carrying around a brick-laden backpack wherever we go. The extra weight makes hard work out of everything we do. We are constantly miserable and negative and depression soon moves into our lives. Well, what on earth can we do about it? Remember the scene in the classic Christian book Pilgrim's Progress? I mean, I read it as a kid. I don't know how many others have read it. But in that story, Christian struggles up the hill to the cross, bearing a massive burden of sin on his back. He gets to the cross, confesses and repents of his sin, and the massive burden falls off, and he walks away free. Beautiful story. This moving scene demonstrates the freedom from guilt we have when Jesus removes the heavy bag of sin from our backs and throws it far away from us. Micah 7 verse 19 says, and hurls them into the depths of the sea. Isn't that beautiful? Never to be seen again. Goodbye guilt. Goodbye regret. Good riddance. Gone forever. As Paul wrote in Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We might think of this as a no condemnation clause in our new covenant with God, made possible only by the shed blood of Christ. We are forgiven of all past offences and even all future offences one. We are totally free, literally released from our weighty burden. But God also gives us a burden of freedom. That means this incomparable gift is ours only if we accept it and thereby thereby assume the responsibilities that goes with it. But we are still free to refuse it. How many times do we lay our heavy burden at the cross but after a period of time we reject God's grace extended to us and then we sneak back and we pick up that burden again. We do it, don't we? I've spoken with many people who have done just that. They were determined to hang on to their guilt. Surprisingly, forgiving ourselves is not always easy to do. In fact, sometimes it is more difficult to do than forgiving others. But we must learn to forgive ourselves. Even if we don't feel like it or don't feel worthy of it, we must crawl out from under the pile of crushing rocks of regret and guilt that sometimes overwhelm us. So how do we do that? How do we get out from over, how do we get over our guilt and regret? Well, we need to learn how to deal positively and effectively with our guilt and allow God to fully apply the completed work of redemption he accomplished at Calvary for us. We can do that by using the powerful acrostic F-O-R-G-I-V-E-N. What is it? Forgiven. We use that powerful acrostic. Sometimes it's useful going through this process with a trusted friend, someone you know who will keep what you say completely confidential. So first let's look at F. Now I've got some outlines here so you don't have to write anything down if you don't want to, but you can take that away and you can work through them in your own quiet times. Now F is find the source of your guilt. John, the builder I worked with, the mother and the businessman, knew exactly where their guilt came from. They were tormented by memories of past actions they knew were wrong. I wonder if there's someone here this morning 
that's in a similar position. And when we know where our guilt comes from, that's true guilt. As strange as it may sound, true guilt is our friend and occurs only because what we have, of what we have done. Just as a fever is a signal to our bodies that something is not right, true guilt is a spiritual warning to us. It tells, our, it tells us our sins are hiding, and who we, uh, are hiding who we really are, children of God, and called to be what we should be to reflect his image. And our guilt will hide both those things. But there's also false guilt based not on specific sinful action, but on being ashamed of who we are. False guilt comes from perceiving ourselves as basically defective. Now, there's a little boy who had a big sign in his bedroom. He wrote and put up on his world, God does not make junk. God does not make junk. This defect is basically defective thought comes and it surfaces when we can't stop blaming ourselves even though we have done nothing wrong or we have since confessed and turned from our sin. Such unfounded shame causes a deep sense of unworthiness, completely the opposite of how God sees us. In the 17th century, Bishop Robert South said this. I, felt this, I found this to be very, very interesting, particularly if you have done some work in metal. Guilt upon conscience is like rust upon iron. It both defies and defiles and consumes it, gnawing and creeping into it, as that does which at last eats out the very heart and the substance of the metal. Isn't that interesting? Guilt is like rust in metal. That kind of toxic guilt is our enemy and certainly not the will of God. His purpose for guilt is to correct us and build us up, not to destroy our heart and cripple our soul and our spirit. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7.10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. When you struggle with feelings of guilt, begin by discerning the difference between a friend and foe. Acknowledge your sins honestly, but reject the temptation to see yourself as fundamentally flawed and unworthy. Dig yourself out from under that rock pile of guilt and regret. So O, O stands for own responsibility for your sin. Once we know the source of our guilt, the next step is to own up to it. Repent and confess the offence. Johann Arnold wrote this, Guilt works in secret and it loses its power only when it is allowed out into the open. Often our desire to appear righteous keeps us from admitting our wrongs. Why acknowledge a foolish choice or a dumb mistake? Yet the more we try to push such, such things to the back of our minds, the more they will plague us, even if only subconsciously. Eventually guilt will add to guilt and we will become cramped and weighed down. Just like that big backpack full of bricks. To repent means to change your mind, to agree with God that you have sinned and turned back to him. When you do, God's response is guaranteed. 1 John 1 and 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If you don't know that verse off by heart, learn it tomorrow. Then why do feelings of guilt sometimes persist even after we have confessed our sin to God and accepted his forgiveness? Now, another good question. It could be that we also need to repair the damage our offence has caused. Until then, you can't, you can't be completely free. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come 
and offer your gift. Now, sometimes that's not always possible because the person we may have offended has since passed away and we can't do that. Confess your sins, then repay those whom you've harmed and when you do, you'll rob your guilt of power and purpose. It will die like a fire without fuel. Repentance and restitution will keep those rocks of regret from piling up. Ah, realise that God means what he says. God's forgiveness is free and it's sufficient. It can't be purchased with any amount of penance. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 7 and 8, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Have you ever lavished something on somebody? Wonderful thought, isn't it? All wisdom and understanding. Free and sufficient. But that doesn't mean it's always accepted. How many times have we heard the phrase, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. We've heard that many times, haven't we? By the time we reach adulthood, we've probably been suckered one too many to- times by false hopes at that and are deeply suspicious of any claims that promise us something for nothing. True? But God is not another smooth talker. No way. There are no hidden clauses in the contract. Forgiveness delivers the goods exactly as advertised. Complete, unconditional and absolutely free. Absolutely. When we suffer from prolonged guilt, that's a sign we have not yet learned to take God at his word. Choose to believe what God says. Thank him for the gift of his son who paid for our forgiveness. Do both, even if you don't feel forgiven, and then refuse to harbour any more accusing thoughts. Refuse to be tempted to carry around a few rocks of regret as penance. Don't have to. God's dealt with it all. G, give up dwelling in the past. Listen to this story of Ashley. Ashley called her pastor one evening because Brian, a Christian man who was head over heels in love with her, asked her to marry him. It didn't take much to hear the hesitation in her voice. So what's the problem? The pastor asked. The problem is I can't say yes, I don't deserve him. Ashley had been married once before and the relationship came to a sudden end when she had an affair with another man. It was stupid and completely wrong. I will never be able to forgive myself for how badly I hurt my first husband. I can't marry Brian because of my past failures. Sometimes what we need to hear is the last thing that we expect to hear. So the pastor said, Ashley, do you think you were smarter than God? Mm, something to think about, isn't it? Of course, I was not trying to accuse her, but only help her see an important truth. Although some sins, such as adultery, bring more severe consequences than others, to God, sin is sin. He forgave all our sins, every last one of them. The sweeping scope of grace makes some hearts sore and others stumble. It just seems too good to be true. Yes, it is too good, but it is true. If you cling to the past and refuse to forgive yourself, you play God with your guilt and claim the right to undo what he has done. The very last words Jesus spoke on the cross were, it is finished. All the work that needed to be done for our forgiveness, he finished. That means there's nothing left to do, 
No bags of rocks to weigh your heart down. No rock piles of regret that crush your spirit. Sometimes we all need to be reminded this means you and me. Happily, Ashley listened and began to forgive herself without her bag of guilt. She was free to give up the past and enjoy the present. Beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful. I invest time in renewing your mind. Being free from the past means that we can now exercise the phenomenal power that is ours in each new moment. The power to choose what we think and what we believe. Just stop and have a think about this. The only time you have is this moment right now. Let me say it again. The only time you have is this moment right now. The past in which you may be investing so much energy, feeling guilty, is gone. Nothing you do or say will now change what has already occurred. The future about which we worry so much is also out of our reach and always will be. Any influence we have over the course of our lives can only be exercised in the present tense, right now. Here and now our minds and thoughts belong to us and will obey our intentions. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 22 and 23, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Wow. Put off your old ways of thinking about your guilt. To forgive yourself, take time to actively affirm what you know to be true about God's grace. Read, memorise and let your thoughts dwell on scriptures that emphasise the forgiveness of God and the grace he has extended to you. In Christ Jesus. Make a habit of thanking and praising him every day for his gift to you of guilt-free living and for freeing you from ever having to spend another moment under that stony mound of regret and guilt. I still haven't got over this cold thing yet. V verily. Verify truth when Satan accuses you. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Take hold of truth because Satan will accuse you and me. We can count on it because that's his favourite weapon. In Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11, we read that after Jesus was baptised, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And there Satan challenged and tempted the Son of God. If you really are the Son of God, you'll be able to feed yourself. If you really are the Son of God... His angels would save you if you threw yourself off this cliff, and so on. So how much more should we expect to endure Satan's accusations, especially since we know we have sinned? Jesus never sinned, but we have. Satan whispers in our ear, Oh, if you really were a child of God, how could you have done such a thing? Get back back under that rock pile of regrets where you belong. Oh, he does it too often, doesn't he? Fortunately, Jesus Jesus modelled how to counter Satan, whom he calls the father of lies. He wielded a weapon. What was it? You don't know? The word of God. (laughs) The truth. Three powerful words. It is is written, sent Satan on his way. Each time Satan tempted Jesus to prove himself, Jesus answered with the word of God. And we must do the same when we are tempted to believe that God's forgiveness doesn't apply to us. Those rocks of regret and guilt will weigh us down for life. Psalm 103 verses 10 to 12 says, he has, not dwelt, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. 
As far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions from us. Do the west and the east ever meet? That's how far God has turfed out our transgressions. Truth, the word of God is our most, most powerful weapon. Pick it up and use it. So now we come to E. Exchange your life for the life of Christ. Here's another story to illustrate this principle. When Lucy was arrested for drug trafficking, she had no one to call for help but her parents. She came from a Christian family, but at uni she had wandered far away from what she knew to be true. And how often does that happen? Sitting in that jail cell was bad enough, she said, but I thought I would die from the pain I saw on my father's face when he came to pick me up. Can you imagine it? In time, Lucy's parents forgave her and were ready to forget the whole episode, but she continued to feel ashamed and useless. I don't think I can ever forgive myself for the stupid things I've done. Of course you can't. Well, not without, without help anyway. The truth is none of us can live the Christian life in our own strength. We must realise that Christ not only became a substitute for us in his death, but he stands for us in his life as well. Andrew was talking about that a little bit this morning, wasn't he? Having purchased our forgiveness, he then transforms us inside out so that we are able to receive his forgiveness. We can personally claim, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, friends, there is no better news than that. None. No better news than that. And what's our part? To let go of our life in exchange for living in the power of our Lord. We are to let him live through us and he will never direct us to crawl back under a rock pile of regret and guilt again. End. Notice that God brings our feelings in line with the facts when we obey him. You know, there were no spiritual facts driving John to feel he had let God down by not going to Africa. None. He was compelled only by one thing, his feelings of shame and guilt. He felt ineligible for any measure of God's grace. Only God's second best for his life. Isn't it tragic? His feelings of unworthiness and self-condemnation could have been replaced with profound gratitude and acceptance of God's free gift, the gift of forgiveness. But he couldn't bring himself to accept it. Perseverance in spite of what you feel pays off. Forgiving others and forgiving yourself, even when you don't feel like it, guarantees freedom. The writer of the book of Hebrews understood this when he wrote in Hebrews 10.36, You have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. The will of God is that you forgive yourself as freely as he forgave you. That's the will of God for all of our lives. That we'll forgive ourselves as freely as he forgave us. That's the essence of the good news of the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. That is the no condemnation clause that releases you and me from the punishment for our failures. Now here's something I just discovered this week. Have a listen to this. Nowhere in the Bible will you ever find a list of sins that are exempted 
from God's grace. Isn't that fabulous? Nowhere in the Bible will you ever find a list of sins that are exempted from God's grace. That means no matter what we've done or how unforgivable we feel, as a Christian, redemption by God's grace is already ours. Wow. You are F O R G I V E N. Period. No exceptions, not even for you. But remember to do your part, confessing your sins to God and others and repairing any any damage you've done, if at all possible. Then let God do his part, freeing you and empowering you to become all that he intends you to be. Wow. Forgiven. You know, David was a man who God said was a man after his own heart. And we know the stories of David. But in Psalm 51, David wrote a prayer after he had been caught out for committing adultery and murder. I'm not going to read the whole lot, but I'll just read bits of it for you. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Cleanse me and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me out from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. That could be your prayer this morning. I don't know where you stand. I don't know what's going on in your lives. But that could be your prayer, because you remember David... He did the wrong thing and for quite some time the little baby got sick and then he died. He was distraught and many of the Psalms you read will tell you about it was. But in the end, he came to that point of forgiving himself because he realised what God had done for him. Let's pray. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, there's just so much in your word that we can learn and that we can put into practice in our lives. And so we want to pray today that you will help us to forgive ourselves. Lord, some of us here this morning are riddled with guilt and about what things that may have happened in the past and we just can't get over it. We carry around that backpack full of bricks of regret and guilt. But Lord, we want to pray this morning that your Holy Spirit will move in a very real way to show us that we have been forgiven and that we are not in that position where we can where we are unacceptable to you. And so Lord, we just want to pray today that your Holy Spirit will move amongst each and every one of us and show us from your word and by your word that we are wonderful creations created in the very image of God, that we are perfect in your image. So Lord, just bless us as we think about these things. Help us if we need to work through these things ourselves or with somebody else, that we will be able to do that and that your Holy Spirit will be able to change us and make us into the people that you want us to be, living the life that you want us to live. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.